it's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. And by that I mean it's still being able to be driven around like a, like a normal car. But it's got that mental aspect as well if you want to go scare yourself or, or give your mates a laugh. And I've taken plenty of people for running it and they get out of it and they're just like, oh shit, that is just off its face. I also look at it like a bit of an antidepressant. So if I've had a bad, stressy day at work, I go and either play with the car or I just take it for a drive. And all of that stuff's a whole different world. You know, it's, it's, um, it's escapism, I suppose. The car runs naturally aspirated in the region of around 700 horsepower and then there's a 175 shot of nitrous on top of that. Um, so if you're on the button, you'd be sort of 850 horsepower, maybe nine on a good day. If it's nice and cold in the air, it's enough to wake you up. Burning dinosaurs is, is sort of part of owning a, an Australian muscle car. It eats tyres. I get about four rears to one set of fronts, and that's obviously down to my heavy right foot. I first saw the XC Ford that I own now uh, back in the mid to late 90s. Uh, I was working uh, as a marine technician. There was an apprentice there, a fellow called Chris Brower, who bought this car. And uh, back then it was uh, Chocolate Brown, or its technical name is Walnut Burl. And Chris drove that round for a number of years. Um, and then it was involved in a, a grass fire, and uh, he was at a, a BNS ball which is uh, in Australia, Bachelor and Spencer's Ball, and you drink copious amounts of rum and go do donuts in a big grass paddock and sort of lay your eyes around. And he parked the car up and uh, went off to have a few rums and came back and the car was on fire. So it obviously caught fire from the exhaust on the grass and it burnt the car up to the hip line and burnt out the engine bay and the grill was melted and the carpets were all burnt inside. And that was sort of it for the car. It was then parked in the shed and uh, he proceeded to parted out basically, sold the engine and sold the dash and all the various bits and pieces of it. And I ended up buying the car off him for the pricely sum of $200. Yeah, then proceeded to get it repainted up to the hip line and search for a whole heap of parts and find another engine and just, you know, accumulate bits over a number of years uh, and then get it uh, back on the road. So I drove it around in that guise uh, for a while uh, and then proceeded to, um, to start modifying it. It's a, uh, it's a 400 Cleveland engine that's been stroked to 434 cubic inches. It's a CHI heads on it, uh, it's got custom extractors, it's got a high rise uh, 3V manifold. I've recently put fuel injection on it. Um, it's got a March serpentine belt system on it, it's got 175 horsepower a nitrous oxide system on it. It's got a 4.8 stall converter in it which lets you build the horsepower up before you actually launch the car. It's got uh, Moser center, Moser axles, got a Detroit locker, runs 4.11 uh, diff gears. And again, that's just to really get that power down. Um, so it's not fast, about 140 mile an hour fast, but it gets there in 10 seconds. So, and that's, that's the rush. I think if you ask me to define what makes an Australian muscle car an Australian muscle car, as opposed to something American, it was very much a, a case of how can we be better than the Yanks at their own game to a degree. And I think the fact that there's a lot of, there's a lot of history there with Australia and, and racing and just, you know, trying to make the best out of not a lot of resource. You, you know, Americans back in the 60s and 70s had huge amounts of, of corporate budget whereas in the Australian market it was much more limited so there was that we'll make something out of nothing attitude and you know a lot of the go fast parts that come out of Australia are now being adopted back into the American market because we've to a degree done better at, at a lot of those components. When the XC was launched in Australia in 1976 uh, there was a bit of a mixed camp really. The XC was the last of that model run. 
And what they were trying to do was they were trying to compete for that European market. So a lot of the advertising, a lot of the sales pitches back in 1976 were an Australian car with a European feel. So they used uh, plush velour interiors, they gave them sports get dashes, they gave them air scoops. And what they were finding is people didn't really accept the XC and there was the fuel scare coming in. Australia had just released 27A, which is a design rule on the emissions piece. And what that did is it strangled horsepower in the cars. They sold about 150,000 units, which is fairly low production um, in the whole scheme of things. And the people were waiting for the XD to come out, which was you know, one of the cars that had been shown at the motor shows prior that this is the future. And they were plastic bumpers, they're very square, um, quite angular. And that was the real European push. People who were going to buy a car just basically held out. And now there's a bit of a resurgence on the XCs because people have realised that they were low volume, that they were the last of the chrome bumpers, they were the last of the, that, that muscle car, that 70s muscle car look before they went into the 80s and became even more strangled for horsepower and, and more plain. When I, when I take the XC for a drive, uh, as, as opposed to just my normal daily cars, it's, um, it's quite a visceral thing. You've got smell, you've got vibration, you've got noise, you've got more power than you can use on the road. So people ask me how it, how it handles. I look at the car and it's got skinny front tyres on, it's got 195 uh, 6015s on the front, and it's got uh, 275 6015s on the back. And I sort of look at it and the, the, the stance of the car, it sort of squats down in the back a bit and the front's a little bit proud. And, and again, that's designed that way so you transfer weight to the back when you're doing a launch. And uh, of course, what that does when you're driving down the road is it gives it a, um, I won't say a bit of a whaley feel, but it, the car does tend to sort of float a bit down the road, especially under hard acceleration, um, because that front's, being, that front's being lifted up and trying to transfer that weight back. Um, what it does do though, is it makes it fairly tail happy. It doesn't take much to get the car wet or dry uh, into a little bit of a slide or a little bit of a power run. And, uh, and that sort of brings a, brings a, you know, a big smile to your face. It's just a little, a little world that you sort of cocoon yourself in and it's, you know, it's the 1970s technology combined with some cutting edge technology. It's my youth, it's growing up, it's memories of rebuilding the car, it's making good friends, all associated with that, that car. I've had, I've had people offer to buy the car off me and um, it's not for sale. Yeah, it's one of those things that I see as a bit of an heirloom. Um, my daughter loves it um, and she's eight, eight years of age now, so by the time she's, uh, she's old enough to drive, um, who knows what sort of format the car will be in. Um, you know, I hate to say that at some point it may even be an electric vehicle, you wouldn't know. Um, but the petrol head in me sort of slaps myself in the face when I say that. 